to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. To the elders in the church in Ephesus, in the first century, the apostle Paul said, Shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Friends, Jesus gave his life's blood, his life for the church. If Jesus loved the church so much that he died for it, we ought to love the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today as well. Why should we love the church? And how do we show our love for the Lord's church? That's what we're going to answer in today's lesson. And so we're so glad that you joined us for our study today. If you don't have your Bible ready and out, take a moment, pause, and get your Bible as we're going to look to the Word of God to think about the love we ought to have for the Lord's church. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday for worship or Wednesday for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love others, and who are deeply concerned about the souls of men and women. Friend, if you've got a Bible question, maybe you're wondering about salvation or the church or, or any number of religious uh, matters, you'll find people in the Lord's church in your local area who'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you in kindness and love and look at the truth of God's Word. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your desire to know God better. We encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our lessons. They're available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to make that available to you as a digital download or other formats if you need that as well. And friend, we want to encourage you also to check us out on Facebook, like our Facebook page, follow us on that. Great way to keep up with things that we're doing. And then, of course, in our fast-paced world today, where everybody's got a smartphone, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app that's available in the respective play stores. You can get it there, and it's a great way to keep up with our new lessons, what we're doing, and just so that you can know how we're trying to spread the Gospel and reach people with the news of Jesus Christ. And as always... We want to thank you today for joining us for our study. Hope you've got your Bible ready. Let's look to the Word of God together. Why should a Christian love and commit his life to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? And, and how do we show that love is what we're considering in our lesson today. And so let's begin by thinking about why we love the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, we love and we ought to love the church of Jesus Christ, because it belongs to Christ and to Him only. Listen to 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 11. No other foundation can any man lay except that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Who's the, who's the foundation of the church? Well, the foundation is not some person in the first century, some individual in the first, the foundation is not some great reformer or some great thing, some, some other person. We love the church because Christ is the only founder and he's the one that the church belongs to. I want you to think about the words of Paul. In 1 Corinthians 1, Verses 10 through 13. Would you open your Bible with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1? We love the church of the Lord Jesus Christ because it belongs to Christ 
and Him only. And what a wonderful thing it is to know that Christ is the sole founder and sole owner of His church. 1 Corinthians 1. Look at what some were, how some were trying to abuse that idea. Verse number 10. Paul says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Well, what's the problem? For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of close household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, each of you says, I'm a Paul, or I'm a Paulus, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? You see, Jesus' church, the church that he died for, my friend, it doesn't have, it doesn't belong to men. Men have no right to name that after themselves. I want you to think about what was going on here. Some were saying, when it got down to the nitty gritty, there were some who wanted the glory for themselves. Some were, some were following after other men. Some would say, well, yeah, we're a part of Christ's body. We're just followers of Cephas. We relate to him, maybe. We, we've kind of done things like maybe Cephas or Peter did. We, we're of the body of Christ. We're just followers of Paul. He was a great orator, probably a very engaging speaker to look to. Maybe they had a little preacheritis, you might say. Uh, some said, yeah, we're a part of Christ's body. We're just followers of Paul. Look at the great evangelistic zeal Paul had. I'm of Christ, I'm just a sect of Paul. Paul said this, let there be no divisions among you. Well, what do you mean, Paul? And then look at what he asked in verse 13. He says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Do we understand what it means to be a follower of someone? There are two requirements given here before you can be a follower of somebody else. According to verse 13, that person had to be crucified for you and had to make a sacrifice and you had to be baptized in their name. Of course, nobody's going to claim that Paul or Cephas or Apollos was crucified for them and you're not baptized into their name. Well, friend, if that's the case, if only Jesus made that sacrifice and if we're baptized into his name, added to his church, friend, we need to realize we ought to love the church. Because Christ, it belongs to Christ and Him only. He's the only one that has that right. Why else should we love the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because Jesus died to establish her. Look in your Bible in Acts chapter 20. Friend, I love the beautiful words found in this verse. As Paul reminds the elders in Ephesus that they have got to rise up to their leadership responsibility he says in verse 28, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, or the church of the Lord, which he purchased with his own blood. Why love the church? Because, my friend, when Jesus gave up the ghost, when he gave up his life, when he died here, one of the things he died for was the church to purchase that body, that kingdom, that, that group of the saved. Jesus bought that, paid the price for it with his ultimate blood. You know, we talk about loving the church because Jesus died for it and it only belongs to him. Think about this idea. Let's say that you buy, you're going to buy a home and it's your blood, it's your work, it's your sweat, it's your tears. You pay the note on that every day. Are you going to let your neighbor come over and put his name on the deed? But of course not. Nobody's going to do that. You pay that note. You pay that bill. Uh, you're working hard for that. It belongs to you in that sense. Well, friend, Jesus paid the ultimate price for the church. It belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody else could pay that price even if they wanted to and die as a sinless, perfect, perfect sacrifice for humankind. Nobody could do that. And so we love the church because Jesus lived a perfect life, died as a perfect sacrifice, and he purchased that body of the redeemed to be called out of the world and live every day to give honor 
to Almighty God. Why else do we love the church? We ought to love the church because the church is the place of the saved. Friend, if you love being saved, then you're going to love the place of the saved, right? Look in Acts chapter 2. Where does God put saved people in the Bible? In verse number 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Listen now. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. What is the church? The church is the group or the place where the saved people are. When someone hears the word of God and believes in Jesus as God's son and, and makes a commitment to trust in him, repent of sin, make that great confession, you're baptized into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Friend, you're added to the saved. And the saved are in the church. How can you not love the place where all the saved people are? It's a beautiful place. It's a holy place. It's a place of, that deserves the honor and glory that God has bestowed upon it. Am I saying that every, every person in there is perfect? And every, that's not the idea. But saved people are put in the church. I love the church because I love being saved. And it's the place where all the saved are added by God to his body. Then think about this. We love the church. Because the church has the power to overcome sin and Satan and hell. I want you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 16 with me. And I want you to see what Jesus says about the power the church has to overcome. Matthew chapter 16. I want you to begin reading in verse number 13 with me. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Friend, when you think about those beautiful words, you can imagine the scenario. Jesus has heard what other people say. Hey, this is John. This may be Elijah coming back. Uh, this, he's like Jeremiah or one of the other great prophets. And so he had heard that, and he said to the disciples, Who do, who's everybody else say that I am? He, he knew what they said. Then he said, who do you say that I am? Oh, Peter, he was always the first to speak. Peter said, we know who you are. You're the, you're the anointed. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. And Jesus said, that's right. But people didn't tell you that. My Father in heaven, he's the one who showed you that. And he said, I'm going to say to you that you're Peter. You're, you're, a little, you're a little rock, a little pebble. But on this rock, that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, I'll build my church. And listen to this. And the gates of hell shall not overcome it. Friend, you know what's great about the church? The church will be victorious over all evil, over all the forces of hell, over the devil, and over every foe that rises up. Revelation 11, verse 14 and 15, presents the church as that kingdom which will outlast, outrule, and conquer all other kingdom. You want to be in the safe place against hell and against the devil and against sin? Friend, there's only one. There's only one place that's going to outlive and outlast all of that and it will actually defeat and overcome that. It's in the body of the saved. We love the church because hell's gates, the idea of hell's gates is those who are coming out of it, that, that, that which issues forth from it, evil, ungodliness, sin, the devil. They're not going to conquer the church. They're not going to win the battle. They may, they, they may enter the fight, but they will not be victorious. This is the victory we have, even our faith. The Bible says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph, victory in Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. And thus we're reminded that we have victory over death. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. We have victory over sin. We have victory. Jesus, through death, overcame him by the power of death, who is the devil, and released those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Hebrews 2, verse 14. Death, sin, Satan, evil have ultimately been defeated. Let's get in the safe place. 
where we can find shelter in the time of storm from all of that. My friend, that's in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we love the church? Not even hell and all its forces can overcome it. Why else do we love the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? We love the church because we love others and we love ourselves. God's people love his church because we are the Lord's church. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, Paul said, you are the two Christians in Corinth, members of Christ's body. He said, you are the body of Christ and members individually, one of another. You see, the body is the church, Ephesians 1, verses 21 through 23. And so Paul's reminding us, we're the church. Why do we love the church? Friend, if you love your, if you love your family, if you love your children, if you love those who love God, if you love people who are trying to walk in the light, then just to put it bluntly, you love the church. We love the church because we do what Jesus said, and we love other people. We put them first. Philippians 2, verses 2 through 3. We strive to please not only ourselves, but others, and strive to encourage and help one another get to heaven. But ultimately, we love the church because of where the church is going. My friend, when the world, when the final curtain falls, when this temporary side is done away with, and it will be, 2 Peter 3, verses 9 through 12, the earth and all that's in it will one day be burned up with a fervent heat. When all this comes down, the final curtain falls, the trumpet sounds, what's going to happen to the church? We love the church because of what happens on that day. Open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I want to show you what happens to the church and why we love it because of where it's going on that great day. 1 Corinthians 15, I want you to look in verse number 24. The Bible says, then comes the end. We're talking about final things, resurrection day, when all, when all final curtain falls. Then comes the end. That's great finality. When he delivers, listen to this, when he, when Jesus delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule, all authority, and all power. Now, Understand that the kingdom and the church are synonymous for the same thing. Remember, Jesus said, I'll, I'll build my church. And then he said to Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. Church and the kingdom, evidently from that passage, are one and the same. So what happens to the church and the kingdom when the end comes? Then comes the end, watch this, when he hand delivers the kingdom to the Father. If the church is the people of the saved, where is the church going? Jesus is hand delivering it to the Father. We're going to, we love the church because, my friend, it's the place of safety. Those who are in the church are going to live with God for all eternity apart from the temporal problems and things that we see in this life. We've been promised a beautiful home in heaven with Almighty God. Now, that's why we love the church. But now let's ask ourselves how do we show? our love for the Lord's church. How do, I, how do I show that? It's one thing to say, okay, I love the church and all these ideas are beautiful and that reminds us of how important the church is, but making a commitment to love it, that's a totally different thing. How does an individual show his love for the Lord's church? Friend, we show our love for the church by putting it first, by giving it the proper place it deserves in our life. Would you open your Bible to Matthew chapter 6? Now remember, Jesus has already equated the church and the kingdom as one and the same. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 about how the kingdom should take priority in our life. Matthew chapter 6, I want you to see what the Bible says in verse 33. Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. How do you show your love for the church? Simply by giving it the proper place in your life. What is the proper place? Seek first, not second, third, or fourth, not after you've done everything else, not after you've had all the fun you want and got all your ducks up in a row and everything's okay. Above all else, put the church first. 
above other people. I'm not saying neglect other people, but God's kingdom is first in our marriage. It's first in our parental responsibilities. It's first in our home life. It's first as it relates to what my boss expects me to do. The kingdom comes first, okay? Everything else is going to fall in line behind the kingdom. It's what God has told me to put first, and it's what really matters in this life. And so I've got to ask myself, as I think about my love for the church, am I really giving it the proper place that it deserves? Am I putting it above other things, or do we sometimes let other things get in the way of the church? Secondly, how do we show our love for the Lord's church? We show our love for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ by doing what we can to spread its borders. You remember these words? In Acts chapter 8 is a really graphic scene of how the church is being persecuted. Saul is said to be wreaking havoc on the church, dragging men and women into prison. And then there's this statement in Acts 8 verse 4. Those who were scattered because of that persecution went everywhere preaching the word. You know why they did that? Because that's what Jesus left this earth asking them to do. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel unto every creature. Him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Uh, Matthew 28, 18, Colossians 1, verse 28. Friend, if I really love the church, then I'm gonna spread the borders of that kingdom by teaching people, just like they did in Acts chapter two, what a person's gotta do to be added to God's kingdom. In Acts chapter two, they had to hear the message of Jesus. They had to believe he was the son of God. They were told to repent and be baptized for the remissions of their sins, Acts 2, 38. Those who gladly received his word were baptized, Acts two, verses 41 through 43. And the Lord added to the church daily, those who did that, those who were being saved. And so I want to spread the gospel. Can I make people? Can I force people to open it? That's not what we're saying. But I can tell others. I can be the light to the world that ought to be. I can spread the message of the kingdom and the king to the best of my... That's what we do. In this life, as a servant of God, I represent the king. I'm here to tell the message of the king. I'm here to honor the king. I'm here to help the kingdom grow and flourish as it ought to. And then, my friend, we show our love to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ by really loving one another as we ought to. Hebrews 13.1 says, Let brotherly love continue. Now, friend, everybody in the church is different. Everybody has a different way maybe of looking at, at life, uh, situations. Everybody has a different opinion on things. Not everybody's cut from the same mold. I understand that. There's some people that we more readily want to be around and others who it's harder sometimes. But my responsibility in the church is to love one another. Let brotherly love continue. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. If we are the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, then we need to let love reign supreme. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 13. We show our love to the church by not just, not just filling a pew on Sunday, but actually doing our work that we ought to do for the Lord. Friend, God has not called us to fill a spot, to sit on a pew, just to sit on a pew or to fill a spot in a worship auditorium. I understand the importance of worship and I'm all, I think that's a great thing. It's something every Christian ought to do. Friend, I show my love to the Lord by not just filling a pew, but by doing something for the cause of Christ. That's the example Jesus sets. Mark 10, verse 45, Jesus said, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Are, are we doing good to all men? Are we helping the poor? Are we feeding the hungry? Are we trying to reach people with the gospel? Are we looking for opportunities where there may be problems or difficulty to, to, to try to get in God's grace and God's love and God's mercy in there? What am I doing? What am I doing to work for God and to be a good example like I ought to every day? My friend, the, the things we do for God 
and the things we do for his kingdom, do we realize those are the things that really matter? Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why, Paul? Knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What I do for God, what I do for his kingdom, what I, what I do for the expanding the borders of the church and doing good. Friend, that's not worthless. That's not vain. That has real purpose in this life. And so let's ask ourselves today, do we really love the church? Do we really love the church Jesus died for? Do we really love that, that place of the saved? Do we really love one another? Really, we're asking, do we love the Lord and his cause? And are we willing to give ourselves in an effort to reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Friend, we want you to know today that the God of heaven does love you deeply. More than anything in all the world, he wants you to be saved. God wants all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, and that begins with you. Have you heard the message about Jesus, that he's the savior of the world, that he's the way, the truth, and life, that nobody comes to the Father except by him? John 14, 6. Do, do you believe that? Are you willing to make a commitment to that truth and live your life by it? If so, would you turn from a life of sin and turn to God in repentance? Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Having acknowledged him as Lord and Savior, would you be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. And then will we rise out of that water to live a new life, honoring God and his church every day? If you're not a child of God, we urge you to become one today. If you are a Christian, let's make sure we love the kingdom and we're living for it every day. Join us next time as we study more from the Word of God. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs, today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.